This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and uh, uh, just want to share that we just arrived, my friend Smithy and I, we just arrived this morning uh, at about 10. So uh, we've traveled all through the night. But as someone on my table just asked me, how do you keep your energy levels up? Um, what keeps my energy levels up is good conversation. And a good conversation means a dialogue, both ways. So I frankly just to confess that uh, this way of speaking from behind a podium is really not my style. I really like to have uh, a sort of interaction with the audience, what people have to say, and a live discussion and not a one-way thing. So I hope we'll make it that. Um, at any time in the middle, you want to ask anything or you want to take it somewhere, please go ahead. Just feel free. I don't mind being interrupted. I would like to start with a little interactive exercise, if it's OK by you. On every table, there's a little sheet of paper. Uh, you may have noticed already, and some pens. Uh, that's there for a purpose. Uh, I would just like all of you to reflect, not too long, just five minutes, on, let's say, three abilities that people need to have to, for us as human beings to face the challenges of the 21st century. So three abilities that people need to have for humans to face the challenges of the 21st century. OK, maybe you just can go ahead. Yeah. Wherever you are, you can just speak up. Creative thinking, OK? OK? Adaptability. Adaptability. Yes? Yes, over there? Determination. Determination. Yes? Yes? Empathy. Empathy. You were saying something? Ability. Communication ability? Character. character. Empathy, character. I am putting empathy and communication together. There's a link. That's the only reason. I better write sp uh, start writing small. <laughs> yes. OK, can I connect that to empathy? Is that OK? Uh, respect for others. Viewpoint. Yes. Yes. Foresight. Foresight. Insight. <laughs> Courage. OK. Yes. Desire to serve. Optimism. Ability to listen. Communication. Can we go with that? No. You want it separate? Okay. Uh, desire to serve. 
and optimism. Yes? Okay, so think and act globally. Mm, would you say global consciousness? Can I do that? Okay. Just to make it smaller, so that I have to write less. <laughs> yes. Spirituality. Spirituality. Commitment. Commitment. Sorry? Tolerance for ambiguity. Okay. Spirituality. Commitment. Uh, okay. Okay with ambiguity. I'm just making it shorter. Sorry? Patience. Okay, maybe one or two more and then we'll stop. Yes. Critical analytical skills. Collaboration. I'll again connect it over here. Critical and analytical. Yes. Authenticity. To read. <laughs> okay, great. I like, okay, let's end at that ability to read because it's very interesting that it comes at the end. Okay, my question is uh, we really, if we can sort of go back to our own lives very personally and look at where was it that some of these things we learned and how did it happen? And try and connect it to uh, our schooling. What was the connection to our schooling? Was it really from our schools that we learned or was it somewhere else? Just by being with people of all age groups, of all kinds. Right. Like? Right. Mostly all of us have learned how to read in school. I did. And we can safely presume that almost anybody who knows how to read has read it in school. Though there are exceptions, of course. Uh, okay. So. That's one that is clearly connected to school. Let's try and see some of the others. Collaboration. collaboration is something you learn at school because you have to collaborate. There are other friends, there are other people. There are even bullies. You need to figure out how to uh, negotiate your way around. Yes, so there is some school element there. Right, because otherwise you will only know of what is immediately around you. That allows you to look for, look at places that you have never visited, you'll never go probably, but you know already about them, right? Right, so schooling connection? So it's dubious, the connection is dubious. Right. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation. So it's the it's not the official arrangement of schooling or the official agenda of schooling that's really doing some of those things. It's happening as an incidental thing to it. Incidental because it's a collection of people. So you're you're collecting, you're coming together. Sorry? Exactly. Right. And uh, are you making also a distinction between teaching some of these things and learning? Because you 
I do believe you can become more creative. Right. Right. So you can't make a plan that we'll do this and like a factory will make a creative person. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that really is, you know, creativity uh, is probably fostered more in an environment of constraints. Because otherwise you don't even need to think hard. Necessity is a mother of invention. So uh, it's probably all the kind of facilities we give to our children. The toys, for example. There's a lovely passage by Rabindranath Tagore about, uh, it's, a, it's a true story as a kid, when one of his friends gets a toy from abroad, from like a beautiful toy, and how it just completely breaks up the community. Because otherwise, the community of children. Those children are constantly so inventive and making toys out of nothing. And when this ready-made toy comes, that stops it. And so I'm mean, just adding on to what you're saying. Yes? Uh, travel. Traveling. Traveling gets a lot of these things. So new exposures kind of things, not, not school, therefore. Yeah. So that's basically that's the point I'm trying to get at, that we typically look at education as something which is uh, there is a historical process, there is a historical legacy. We, we kind of, before we know it, we are put in school, right? And then we are just trying to adapt to that situation. We are asked to get grades, we are asked to go forward, we are told that is what one should aspire for, and we just keep on going on that. Uh, our reflections are limited within a certain paradigm. That paradigm is already set for us. Our thinking is limited within that. But what I really wanted to do here, was to look at it from the other end. Not from the past continuity end, but from the future going back end. Where do we want to go? If we want to go somewhere, we have to think of where do we want to get to, and then work backwards. So if we do that, what do we need to learn in as the generations and generations, future generations come up? What do we need to learn? And is school serving that? And if school is not serving that, can we adapt schools to serve that. And if we cannot adapt schools to serve that, then what is it in society that is serving that? We don't have to get even restricted that there is, is going to be an institution of learning where these things will happen. This can happen in many, many different spaces. So this, um, when I first went through this exercise, someone did it with me, uh, which is many years ago. And I went, when I saw these things, I realized anything that people come up with, this happens over and over again. It's really not, cannot be taught in school through a curriculum, through saying, this is how you become a determined person. Now memorize this and give this answer and you'll become a determined person. It is just not possible. So what we need to think is what are the environments or the spaces where these kinds of things can be fostered. And this is a, a very sort of general overview. I think this applies to every society, every time, every place. But what I really wanted to do with you is to share uh, three different case studies in a very short time. We don't have too much time. Uh, and I hope we'll bring out some parts of India through that because that's what I'm most familiar with. One, of course, is my own organization um, where um, Tara knows the area very well. She's traveled there. We are in the center of Delhi uh, where the richest people live. And they have big houses. And being rich in India means you have an army of servants looking after every need of yours. Uh, there's someone to cook, there's a driver, there's someone to wash clothes. Everything gets done for you. Now, uh, the children that I work with are growing up in those servant quarters. They're children of those servants. Uh, very small houses, uh, but they're not the poorest of the poor. They've got shelter, they're not street children. Some of you may have already, already seen Slumdog Millionaire. I'll just use it as a reference point uh, sometimes maybe. Um, they're not children who are orphans, who are on the street. They have homes to go to. Their parents earn a small income and can put them in public schools. Now what's happening in those public schools is uh, that it's, it's a big inflated promise 
that if you send your children to school, it's both stated and unstated. You send your children to school and your children will really have a shot at the kind of lifestyles they see right next to them. Where people spend the amount of money on a meal that their parents earn in a month. I want to say that again. The amount of money they spend on a single meal could be the amount of money that their parents earn in an entire month, which is going to look after the whole family's food, clothes, education, and they're living cheek by jaw. They're living next door to each other. It's not far away somewhere. You see these lifestyles, and of course TV brings everybody ho everything home anyway. It's right there. So what it creates is a kind of aspiration level of uh, reaching somewhere materially, and no way with all to reach there. There are really very few avenues. You cannot really imagine you'll ever get there. And what is that avenue, if at all? That's school. If you put your children to school, they get an education, they have a shot at that. That's the promise. Reality, those schools are terribly suited for the purpose. Indian schooling system was set up by the British over 100 years ago, uh, a colonized country for which the system was set up by a colonizing power who really didn't want people to think for themselves. And uh, we've, ha we've been independent for 60 years, but we've only tinkered with the system for the same problem. This, the issue is that whatever you have already, already set up, this, all that legacy, there's vested interests all fixed, you start to change that. You start with something which should really be, if possible, completely removed and start with a fresh sheet of paper, with a fresh sheet, like fresh mind, and that was never done. We've only tinkered with it. Uh, as a result, it does not serve the large majorities of Indian people. It serves a, it does serve a very tiny minority, and there are some people, you know, who would, uh, from India, who would disagree with me vehemently, because they'd say the Indian education system is very good because it has worked for them so well. And I'm, I'm actually one of those, because um, uh, Peter was sharing the institute I went to, I am in Ahmedabad. It's harder to get into I am Ahmedabad than probably any business school in the world. It's that level of competition. There are maybe about uh, uh, 300,000 people applying for two, 200 seats. 300,000 to 200. That's the level. We have to remember India has a population of over a billion, 20% of the world, and the number of higher education institutes are very limited. So of course people who get there somehow or the other are so competitive, so fiercely competitive and such hard workers that then they go anywhere in the world, they're going to excel. And we see only them and we say, oh wow, Indian education system must be wonderful because it's producing all these brilliant people, brilliant software engineers, brilliant whatever. Um, but what is it doing to the vast majorities? Out of every hundred children born in India, only one or two graduate from college. And college education in India is similar to high school education. It's of the same, considered the same level. So only one or two graduate. These are statistics, I'm not just making them up. 30 may not even ever go to school. So you have a system where there's a public schooling system which still works on that system of rote memorization. The closer your answer is to what has been given in the key to the examiner, the more marks you get. As a result, when you pass out and you finish and you're looking for an ordinary person, I'm saying, not those who are who will adapt to any situation, and you're looking for a job, you are not only unemployed, they call you unemployable. The, your education has not even prepared you for what's out there. So just that was just the context. What we at Manzil are trying to do is to really look at from these principles. What kind of a space we can create where people can pick up these things because that is what is going to help them in their life, whether they have marks in school or not. So schooling is something that, uh, this is really very apt quotation here from Mark Twain, who said once, uh, never let school interfere with your education. And I really have to do that all the time, hard. You know, get the school out of the way because it's constantly interfering because this is what we have to study and we have to memorize this and I have to get these marks. But if you remove that and try and create spaces like these where all this happens, I'll show you a little clip of Manzil uh, on the video. It's just three minutes long. Uh, there's a song that goes in the background 
And the song is actually made by one of our students. He wrote it. And the music is composed by a group of uh, five of them. They act actually formed a band. And uh, they don't come on the screen. But there are different images of Manjil. And after that, maybe I can share a little bit more of what all happens. And then maybe you'll have time for two quick case studies more for different organizations and people that I know personally. You can stop me at any time you want. Just reminding. Can you help me? Uh, Evan? This boy came to me when he was 12 years old. Um, his father is a driver. Since he is 16, he's been working to provide for his family. Two younger brothers, mother. He is now the chief coordinator in Manzil. That, that's me. <laughs> I sometimes have a desire to not shave. <laughs> and this is actually a group of American students interacting with our students. There's a Vermont group that comes every year. And that's my home. You'll notice that people of all ages are constantly together. Another problem I find with schooling, you bunch up people of the same age together, and of course they'll be competitive. There's a theater group that makes its own plays. Uh, Improvises them and usually on an issue. The students are the teachers. They're constantly encouraged to take on a role, a class. And now there are about 20 student teachers who manage the whole program. I've been here for about a month. Everything goes on as usual. There's no staff. Okay, so our, all our other studies happen in Hindi, but we teach English conversation. And I'll share with you why. This boy dropped out of class 7th much before I met him. He's there again with the dark glasses. He's an excellent artist. Very, very creative person. That's made by him. For a recent show, he put together a kite 16 feet large as the backdrop of the stage. I don't know how he did it. We had no place to even build it, but he...
we do a lot of traveling together because it's, as you were saying, a lot to learn from travels. It's just a visit. This is Ladakh. This is a, one of the examples I'll take, the case study of a school in uh, central India. All these shots were taken by these two boys and they're also now further teachers. They've put together this film, edited it. Okay. Yeah, uh, so what's really happening, I mean you've got some glimpses here, but I uh, just want to quickly share what's really happening over there, is uh, you, as you saw there are students of many different ages, the youngest is about 7, oldest is 28, we don't stop anyone, if you're interested in learning about something, you're welcome. Uh, it started off with maths classes, started quite by chance, uh, when I met and I had a chance encounter with two boys, otherwise my life was going in its own way, this was about 12 years ago. And uh, I quickly realized that really it makes no difference whether you know your trigonometry or not for most people. I mean, how much do we remember? Uh, and there's a favorite question of mine from trigonometry that I pose in front of all kinds of distinguished audiences and say, okay, who's going to crack this? And I rarely get an answer. And it doesn't matter. That's the point. The point is not that people don't know and what smartness, but it does not matter. But what matters in this context is English. It's a very banal kind of an answer. But there is a, the problem of language in India is very, very complex. Uh, after watching Slumdog Millionaire, you might think that everybody in India speaks English. Let me just give you some statistics. Only 5% people in India speak English. Only 5%. 95% don't understand English. And yet every Indian you'll meet here will speak English fluently, even if he's never, ever come here. And that's because only those kinds of Indians reach here. Because you have a schooling system where there is uh, English medium schools, elite schools, where everyone, including me, who can afford it, we went and we learned English as a native language. And, uh, but that is not available to vast majorities. For the vast majorities, there is no single language which everyone speaks. Uh, the, probably the largest spoken language would be, or understood at least, would be Hindi which about 30% people understand. North India, everybody can get by. South India, nobody understands. So if I travel South India, I don't have a common language to talk to people to in. But of course, those who are educated in the private schooling system, they speak English, so I get by with English. So willy-nilly, English enters like the lingua franca of India. All higher uh, uh, justice, like law system, is entirely in English. Higher education is in English. It really places a very big burden on people who do not speak the language and they feel like second class citizens, especially in a place like Khan Market. So we started the English conversation classes, uh, not just to learn another language, but to really be able to communicate to anyone, not feel lower about themselves. But not focusing only on the learning of the classes, but uh, like learning of English, but through that, what do we really want to learn? Who do we want to meet? Where can all this kind of openness come from? What are the kind of people you're meeting? Um, but what really happened from there, when there's a space that becomes like a magnet, attracts people, uh, and it, there's the right kind of thing you, uh, you know, plan around it, uh, it really became a place where you take initiative for whatever you want to learn. And you, there is no creativity comes from not providing, no constraints. Uh, if you want to learn music, as all of these people have, many of these people have learned, we did not bring in a music teacher to teach them. We just said, band together, if you are all interested in music, at least come as a group. There's a power in that collection. You give moral support to each other. You can learn from each other. 
and then we can probably invite someone who is uh, maybe interested in music, maybe learning, and say, hey, why not come and spend some time with the children here? There's a young group, and they're very keen. And when that interaction happens, sometimes it just takes a shape, and sometimes it doesn't. So with all of these processes, we have uh, uh, two music groups that are writing their own songs, composing their own music, performing professionally. And many people who are interested in music. There's theater, again, devising your own plays. So the Tuberculosis Association of India uh, approached them saying, we want to raise awareness about tuberculosis. Could you do street plays? So they had to learn themselves. That's a good way of learning yourself instead of for marks. And then uh, there's a filmmaking group. There is uh, dance, uh, arts, painting. A lot of things have just flourished and all in a very self-organizing way. As I said, we don't have any staff. Everybody's teaching everybody else. We've managed to build a certain culture around that. And as a, and what we're really trying to do is work on both levels. So one is improve the ability for employment and for participation, really, in all that is possible around you. But at the same time, start questioning a lot of these aspirations, especially material aspirations. Where do they really come from that I must have this in order to feel a happy life, or, or feel you know I've arrived? You really uh, think about it a little bit. A little bit. You know, uh, just simple back of the envelope calculations will show you that the way of consumption that we are headed towards is simply not sustainable if we want to spread to everyone in the world. Um, I would really encourage you to watch a video if you have not done this. Uh, it's on storyofstuff.com. Some of you may have seen it already. Uh, it's an American film, so they take an American example. 5% of the population of the earth consumes 30% of the resources. And now, a place like India, 20% of the population of the earth, if they really catch up, they need 120% of the resources. So of course there's no China. And USA will give up its 30% for India to really have that. None of this is really going to happen. We are not playing catch up. The rules of the game are different from what we had imagined. We have to understand that. So what we really have to go towards Probably, I, I read the slogan recently and I think it captures it very powerfully. No poverty, no affluence. It's something that Gandhiji really pointed us out to. And I'm sorry to say, but a lot of Indians also don't understand that and have not read into it deeply. He was really not talking about Indian independence from British rule, but of a much deeper thing. Uh, so. Those are the two areas that we are constantly working on. Improving the ability of people to uh, at least have a basic livelihood, food, uh, shelter, clothing, but also questioning why do they want to go to that level. Uh, I want to quickly move to another uh, area, completely different. Uh, it's an area in central India, of which we show a little snap. Uh, it's it's a region where there is a predominant tribal population. Now, for those of you who are not, uh, may not be familiar with this word, but the, uh, the analogous term here would be indigenous populations. Uh, the indigenous populations in the US is, I believe, very tiny, uh, restricted to certain areas, and in some ways also integrated maybe in society, but maybe not able to hold on to its culture. That's not what happened in India. India had indigenous societies from before. And uh, even though they were not completely sort of uh, confined or uh, destroyed by the uh, coming people, uh, yet there was a lot of, and there still is, uh, though it's uh, highly reduced, but there still is a lot of non-tribal and tribal interactions that they happen. There's a lot of exploitation at one end. Now, we have a schooling system that extends throughout India. By and large, it's the same, with no difference. Because one of the purposes of it was to unify this country after independence, when a lot of people believe that it cannot stay together as one country. There's nothing that binds them together. No language, no culture, no religion. Everything is so diverse. Someone said very interestingly, uh, India is Europe united without as much fuss. <laughs> so uh, that being the purpose of bringing through education, creating a kind of idea of nationalism, uh, it's not taking into account the needs of different spaces. So there's a certain historical process uh, 
uh, of uh, this, this oppression of the non, by the non-tribal communities, of the tribal communities, and even the state is in the power of the non-tribals. And if there's a school that runs in an area like that and does not bring it up and reinforces that, how does change really happen over there? That is the question that this place was really grappling with. Uh, or the way they would put it is, why is it that the people who get the best education, what they really learn is how to work the status quo for self-advancement instead of recognizing their power to change the unjust status quo in the first place. I want to say that again. Uh, there is an unjust status quo in place. It's already there for whatever reasons. And we are not always supposed to feel guilty or responsible for it. But it is there. Why is it that the most educated people, what they really learn is how to negotiate that in such a way that they can come out of it instead of working or recognizing their power to change that, that structural violence system in the first place. That was the problem that they were facing in this area, that you, have, you may have non-tribal children who are bright and academically like really good, though they'd be a minority, but if they get the right educational input, they could get out. But they would get out, but the system for everyone else remains the same. How do you change that? So they looked at things like history, for example. Why do we learn history in the first place? We are told that we learn history because we must know where we've been to really understand where we are today. But how do we learn history, typically in India? National leaders of the independence struggle, Gandhi, Nehru, all of these people you learn about, their lives. But what it does is that you do not recognize that there have always been local heroes fighting or struggling for fairness and justice in their own area. And they don't find a place in the textbook because the national level curriculum does not even know of them, people who are setting it up. Those need to be there in the discourse that is happening with the children. Otherwise, they get even further delegitimized. There was no such person. You forget, you know, how do you remember? So that is one thing, to, to take out those examples, and they're much closer, and from their own culture. Then to look at things like if the school, Adhashila is the school that I, I'm talking about, they have, they're on a little hillock. Now to just go back, where, how did the school come on this hillock? What was there before? Who owned this land before? And who owned the land before that? And who owned the land before that? Just go a little bit back. And from that, also trying to understand the kind of changes that are happening in society because of that. Or look at something like in science, we learn about nutrition. This, this is good for us. We should have so much potassium and so much this and so much that, so much protein for our health. But really looking at just around them, what are the levels of nutrition that uh, are there in, the, in society and how even that has changed, how the cropping pattern has changed. What are people growing now? Are people growing for the market or are they going for their own consumption? How has that shifted? So those are the kinds of things you can really bring into consciousness if you localize it in that area, which would have the other uh, advantage of people becoming more empowered to move towards, when we're talking of social change, we're obviously accepting that status quo is not good. Otherwise, why do we need to change? Move towards what is good, what is in fact desirable. There's a third uh, example that I want to take up, and then I'll close and maybe do some questions. Uh, is a place called uh, Sith, which is in the mountains. Uh, this also comes a little bit full circle with Manzil. A uh, lot of our children are from the mountains. The mountains are not very far from Delhi. Uh, it's about uh, 250 kilometers, which should be about uh, 120 miles, a little more, well, 150 miles, something. Uh, the Himalayas start. And uh, traditionally, it's been an agriculture-based society, and agriculture is rain-fed, which means you have only one crop in the year when it rains, and the rest of the time you cannot grow crops. Now, what's happened is that uh, over time, especially, uh, people who want to live off agriculture, they're only able to grow maybe three or four months of the requirement over there. Uh, so you really need to subsidize it from money from outside. So the men folk. If you go to a Garhwali village, you'll find only women or old people or children. 
All the men have moved to cities to earn money, to send back home what we call the money order economy. They send money orders back home, and that's how the system works. Now, this is happening in any case because of the uh, difficulties of living life there. But what has education done over there of the kind that's really spread everywhere? This is what Sid recognized. They saw that people who get e educated, they actually have even less optimism about what can be done over there. They become misfits in their own region. They have to move out. You will not find any Gadwali young person who's smart who stays in Gadwal. He has to move out. Not only that, they start looking down upon their parents' profession, even ashamed to call their father their father. Now, any society where that is happening, there's something wrong. There's, that's, that was the uh, thing that Sid, this organization, uh, really felt. So they really started questioning the whole modern influence or modernizing influence of what should one do? Why, why, sh why is one thinking constantly of leaving and making a... And what do they do when they come to a city? Their education has not equipped them for possibilities in the city. So they'll be same like our parents, uh, our children's parents, drivers and cooks and servants, and not think of the potential and possibilities that are that can actually be done over there in what your own area is. To me, if you are smart, then you would be able to do things where other people don't see possibilities. That's what it is really about. And so it, this, this whole migration, which is a huge issue in India, rural urban migration, gets exacerbated with the uh, kinds of education that's happening. So they realize that the way out is to have very rooted kind of education, which looks at this is now the relationship with nature, which looks at the agriculture, which looks at the forest, which looks at soil. And from that, trying to learn about things and also to appreciate uh, things over there. The curriculum there is designed with the children, by the children, because the children who come to school, they know more about the local botany than any teachers can ever know. They just lived amongst that. So just to recognize that and put that, give that space in the textbook. Um, there, there cannot be one solution. I'm just, uh, you know, wanting to uh, pose questions about how do people see uh, the challenges that are there before the U.S. and in different communities, not just any singular idea, but different spaces. And what is it that we need to do or need to create? as possibilities for this kind of learning to actually take place and not just relegate to something that schools are doing. Another uh, mistake I find we do all the time is to consider schooling or education, actually. Education has something to do with kids or young people. It's a constant process because there's a constant newness of what's in front of you. We need to uh, be taking on the challenges that are coming before us. And now, as a human society and not even as nationals of this country or that country. Those, uh, I've, I hope I've been able to share some of the glimpses of different kinds of places and what people are trying over there. Um, and I'll just end over here, um, saying that we need to look beyond standard uh, off-the-shelf solutions. Uh, we need to also look beyond, I feel strongly, only scalable solutions because just because something is not scalable does not mean it's not serving a useful purpose. Uh, and scalability itself we need to think of in multiple ways because sometimes scalability also means uniformity and that does not take into account what's really needed. And if only we take this on uh, as an imperative, can we really uh, go towards the direction that we really want to go? Uh, because it's a younger generation, the children who are born, who have not yet gotten fixed into patterns with which it's the easiest to develop new, healthier patterns. Thanks. Well, you're here at a university and you're throwing out the challenge about education, so I hope we'll have a rich discussion about this. But let me ask you this. Um, in that list that you put out there, do you think there's 
any educational system that you encounter that actually delivers on some of those things? I don't know so much about education systems outside of India. But I do want to share with you, uh, during my time here, I visited two schools. Spent, in fact, two entire days interacting with the kids, with the teachers, uh, principal. Um, I came to the conclusion that if you just walk into the school first. Ah, OK, I can share it to you in the way it happened. Um, there's a friend uh, of mine who teaches in one of these schools in Oakland. and. Uh, he picked me up at 7, and we reached the school at 7.30, and there were no kids. So I was like, where are the children? Says, children come at quarter to 9. Then what are you doing here so early? Oh, we've got to prepare. Now, this to me is a very, very pleasant surprise. Pleasant because they're such dedicated teachers. They are an hour early, earlier than the children. You will not find that in India at all, even in the private schools. The teachers come after the children come. Right? They're not there before waiting for them. Then I looked at all the resources that are available. Now, this is a school which is on the verge of being closed down because its results are not good. And uh, yet, the amount of resources they have, they can photocopy as much as they want, they can bring all kinds of things, there are books there. I thought, wow, they've got everything set up. And then I met the children, and I realized the job of a teacher in the US is much, much harder than the job of a teacher in India. And the reason is that I don't know what, I really haven't been able to put my finger on it, but what is this relationship between young people and older people? That uh, there is, they were insolent not because they were, uh, they wanted to be insulting, but because they had just no sensitivity to their teachers as human beings. This is what I noticed. The, by and large, the children would walk in and out of class when they wanted. They would talk to each other. They'd make all kinds of jokes, play with their cell phones. It was really I mean, impossible for the teacher to really do any teaching. Now, I may have gone to the worst possible school. I don't know. Uh, there must be better schools. But uh, there is this whole sort of influence of the pop culture from outside into the school which is what teachers are really dealing with. But I also want to, there is grounds for optimism. So I don't want to stop at this. I was there the whole day. When the day ended, there were extra classes. After the classes ended, uh, my friend uh, asked some of the, uh, the students in the class, four of them actually, to show us around the neighborhood. And they uh, took us and we drove in my friend's car, and four of us came with us. And they showed us around the whole neighborhood. And again, very pleasantly surprised, these kids were completely different here. It was almost like they were new kids. They were not the same. Those who were like really being difficult and also quite, you know, I mean, they were doing very simple stuff and not able to do it. You know, I thought, what have they learned till now kind of thing, kind of questions were coming. But yet, they were very intelligent in another environment. So what I told my friend, who's really concerned about what he can do as a teacher, he really wants to do something well, what I told him was, don't invest too much time in school. It's not going to help. The relationship is already mediated by the fact that you're just doing your job and nobody cares about you. But do things outside of school. How can you bring life from outside into the school? Now that's what really is happening at Manzil. Because it happens in a home, it's really not an institution that they're going to. Institutions are failing us. For, by and large, for people. Of course, there are some people who are highly motivated who will get to a college like Emory, and you don't really need so much uh, to make them learn because they have the carrot at the end where they want to get to and they're ambitious. But by and large, people, their potential is not being drawn out by systems. It's, but it's possible to extend the notion of family to a community. And that would be really helpful. I've been, ever since then, I've been telling all my Indian people that I meet here, you've got a major job to play here. Because there is definitely a, a difference you find in the way Indian cultural uh, values are. Uh, just to take an example, um, I go to people's homes and just stay. It's, if I don't stay, they'll get upset. It's, it's not like, uh, people are very, um, they like people to disturb them. 
let me put it like that it's an expression of love right if i if i ask my friend uh, come for coffee and if he says no i don't want to go i want to do this um, i'm just pointing out to a cultural difference i'm very new here if i'm wrong please correct me but they're both coming from a space of respect for the other but how they play out is completely different that's what is my insight somebody said insight is an important thing um, how it plays out over here is that if the other person says i don't want to come i must respect that choice i must not insist but the indian system is if the other person does not want to come i must express my love by insisting come and when i pull him no 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 you you have to come then he feels loved and he comes also <laughs> this is really the way we do things in india so i think that would be a positive virus to introduce in the culture here which has gotten which has taken individual privacy to such an extreme that people have gotten so lonely they're so isolated we don't need to be so lonely and isolated and consumerism may be because of that because what we do the fulfillment we can get with each other we don't get that of course we're going to look at look for it in products my my kids have no hardly any money to spend you never ever see them morose they're never unhappy again a glimpse of it you may have seen in slum dog uh, you may have not you missed it so if you look at it superficially life in india is terrible but you have that's completely superficial even for a homeless person a person living in slums you 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 have to see it to really realize it the joy that they experience and small optimisms is what they live for there's always something to hope for something to look forward to and there's always this energy and there's always this go getting go ahead not materially but always defined in terms of relationships how are we with each other so i it's a long winded answer but i think i don't now look for answers in systems because systems by nature are impersonal they don't have the human quality that we really need i look at people and how can we be more and more such people you know most of these things happen because of the one person who has the vision and in fact even now you go to shantini ketan i went there 2 years ago i didn't get that feeling at all it's probably become like a standard university with the only thing going is some of the classes happen under trees outside in the open but really maybe not much different so it's there there'll always be some people who are doing things with another kind of a vision but it has to have a critical mass for it to become part of the culture now there is a critical mass around learning from the environment whatever is there by adapting and that in india is flourishing now you might look at i state the statistics out of every 100 children born only one or two graduate so rest have no options to do anything but the other fact of india is that only 7% people are employed in what we call the formal sector as in they have a regular salary paying jobs at the end of the month they get a fixed salary 93% of the people again slum dog millionaire are like that living by the wits on the street they may have small businesses they may set something up they don't know what the paycheck at the end of the month is now for all those people they're learning constantly from the environment what do they need to adapt and what they need to do the biggest economic crisis in india is not going to affect these people they're completely resilient your the more specialized you are in a field of study uh it can be that bigger barrier to thinking openly now what's interesting about mba and especially the mba that i did uh for me it was such a refreshing change you know it's one of those centers of excellence in india so all our education is by rote memorization all till college you just memorize things and give the answers 
and then university, and then as soon as I went into my MBA institute, it was completely different. We were not going to memorize anything, and the, we, it was based on case study, and we were constantly in an open-ended situation, and we could argue any which way as long as we could argue for it. For me, that has been just the fact of that kind of way of doing things. I think that's part of how we do things. Constantly remove the cobwebs and think afresh. Do we really need to do it like this? Why are we de doing it like this? To share a simple example uh, on that um, is, uh, so a lot of times when you give free anything, and especially in India they say that all the time, people don't value it so they won't even come regularly. So people said, oh, you, you should start charging. Now I was worried about one thing, that whatever amount I charge, it can be not a disincentive to miss, or it can be such a disincentive to even join, depending on what the income level is. So this would really work if everybody has the same income level. So I can find a point with, with which it would hurt to uh, miss the classes. But that's not true. So we just turned it around the other way. There are no charges to come to Manzil classes. It's ab absolutely free. But every time you miss a class, you pay a fine. So if you're not serious, what you find is that you're accumulating fines and you're not even getting the benefit of the classes. So what do you do? You either become serious or you say quit. No, I don't want to come here. This is too much of a shackles on my freedom. So I don't want to come. Fine, so you leave space for someone else to come. We have a turnover constantly, people joining and leaving. Now it's much less because they've realized that you know, it's a great opportunity and they lose it. And we're happy with the turnover, that's fine. It's, it's self-selecting system. And it's not even keeping anyone out who's not uh, able to pay. Now, if any education, now I'm now taking it beyond uh, MBA question. If any education allows you to think out of the box, it's good. And if it puts you into a jargon kind of a specialized node and this is only the way you'll do it, then it's a problem. I had a recent experience, you know, there was a film about a doctor in India who's created the biggest eye hospital called Arvind Eye Hospital. Um, and that film was shown at Stanford to Stanford students and I was present when that happened. And afterwards the whole uh, discussion went on, how did he do it? How did he manage, and these are the poorest people that he's serving. And if people come and say we can't afford, they give services for free. And yet it's, a not, it's not a not for profit, it's making profit. So what is the business model and how is it working? And that was completely the MBA mind working. And in that they had completely missed out the point of this man. The man did not think of any of these things. He really reminded me of a story that our ex-president uh, uh, used to share a lot. He said he was a scientist, uh, APJ Abdul Kalam. And, uh, and then he became president. So he said, uh, by the law of aerodynamics, a bumblebee can't fly. Its body is too big, it's too heavy, wings are too small. But thank God, the bumblebee doesn't know the laws of aerodynamics. <laughs> so it flies. Yes. Um, the, uh, the, distinction you made, the, the distinction you made a while ago when I mentioned something, uh, the difference between something that you can learn but something that you can't teach, isn't that a very big part of what you're doing? You can't, l you can't teach people collaboration. There's not a list you can teach. They can learn it. You can't teach people patience. They can learn it. You can't teach people adaptability by rote learning and all that. They can learn it. And you're facilitating that and is, and is, is a large part of what you're doing. But isn't there also a place for some of this rote learning? Uh, it's given the, again the example that you took, uh, uh, it's a very good idea, I think, not just to teach the, the broad scope of history, not just the uh, uh, Gandhi and Nehru, but the local heroes and local culture, but there's rote learning involved in that, just like in anything else. Isn't there a place for both? And what you do is a large part allow people to learn ways that they can apply some of the things that they've learned by rote in a real life situation? There is a space for rote learning, but it is over, the, there's more space given, much more space given to it than it should have. Um, there's a fundamental difference in how we're trying to approach things at Manzil. Uh, and I would like to point that out with again a story that happened with me. 
you know, so very close to Khan Market is a place called Lodi Gardens. It's a beautiful garden. If you ever come to Delhi, you must visit. Very large, nice. It has got 15th century monuments within it, uh, tombs and stuff like that from the Lodi dynasty, which was just before the Mughals. Still standing, very nice places. Uh, I've been going there since I was a kid, because just five minutes walk from my home. Uh, I came, I traveled out of the country for the first time in 91, uh, when I worked in Canada. And when I went back, I invited all kinds of people, come, come to our place. You haven't seen India, how come? You know, it's such an interesting country, come. So people came. And the first friend who came, and very proudly, proudly because uh, we have such an old history, and I had noticed that in Canada, North America, if there's a house which is 50 years old or 70 years old, uh, it's a heritage site, people go visit, and there's a ticket put outside, you pay $10. I said, what do they know about history? 500-year-old things are lying around, and nobody even has an interpretation over there, and there's no money to be paid, you just walk in, you know? So I was feeling very proud, you know, unjustly, because there's nothing I've done to do it. Uh, but I took them, I took him to Lodi Garden. And the first question, one of the first questions was, when was this built? I'm saying now 15th century. At that time, I had no idea. And why didn't I have an idea? Well, I was taught in history class. I had learned all of these dynasties, one after the other. But when the time came, I was completely lost. It had not stuck anywhere. I was so embarrassed. I went home and secretly found out, and I've never forgotten since then. Now, there's an insight over there. And this is what I want to say. This is my contention. That learning doesn't happen like in a factory. Human beings are not like this computer. Put all the parts together, put, assemble it, and at the end of it, you have a ready computer. Human beings, the essential part is motivation when they want to learn. So the soil has to be ready for the seed you plant. If the soil is not ready, the, that seed is useless. It's going to do nothing. You may give the best of knowledge at the time that you deem is the right time, but that soil is not ready. What we need to do is always be ready and catching the opportunities when people are ready. And that is what we need to notice. When are people ready for what? And to create a nice stimulating environment where a lot of things are happening where there's learnability. That's where a place like Manzil, it becomes a magnet for all kinds of people. I'm so thankful I met hundreds of different kinds of people, from a fashion designer to farmers. Yes? I was just going to say, but what is it doing if not from a teaching as allowing people to learn? Exactly. What we are working on is how do we are thinking of how do we make a space where learning can be enhanced, maximized, basically. We focus on the space. We focus on the people, and we don't focus on curriculum at all. We have no curriculum. Even in English, we have no curriculum. We don't try and develop it. We don't go to some experts and who's sitting. And what has really helped me is that I don't have an education background. I went to business school. <laughs> so I'm not tied by how things are supposed to be done. I have no idea. I'm a bumblebee. <laughs> this makes sense to me. I'm, I'm doing it. Maybe it's not even working. Some expert can come in and tell me better ways of doing it. I don't mind to learn from him. I'm open. Yes. Uh, one of the concepts that you talked about at the beginning when we were going over uh, the list of what to look for in abilities of the 21st century was collaboration. And I was wondering, do you feel that uh, kind of like the, the seed that is looking to be sown among at least the millennial generation, do you feel that, uh, that American and Indian collaboration could potentially solve a lot of the local kind of micro problems in India that your foundation an organization represents, and also on a larger scale, by bringing people together from a di diverse background. So, having an Emory student uh, who might be in like the same business type of mold, I look in the mirror as well as I think you have too, and say there might be something else in the world that's more important than kind of following the same uh, pattern and trying to look at a different scale. Do you think that's a possibility? Okay, if I understand your question right, uh, if people from, let's say, Emory and over there come together collaboratively, is there a possibility of doing something better? Is that yeah, really what? And, and even on a broader scale as well. So if even on a? On, on a larger scale too. So if you have people from like all of the top universities in the United States with people from India coming together, do you believe that's a possibility to enact that uh, social change? I'll start with the caveat. Uh, we have to really look into ourselves when we talk of a collaboration. Are we willing? to learn from a new space. And the learning has to happen for everyone when there's a collaboration that happens. Often what happens is because the way we think of the world 
uh, let's say even the words we use, developed country and developing country, which is really a euphemism for underdeveloped country. That is how it, was, it first came up. The world was divided by, um, I read some history about this word. Uh, this was Harry Truman who did this after World War II. Uh, the world, the entire world was put into two boxes, developed, underdeveloped, right? Uh, later, underdeveloped sounded too bad, so we called it developing, right? So the developed don't have to develop anymore. They just have to stay where they are. There's, they have no problems. Everything is just perfect. It's heaven. And of course, people in India believe that. You know, I'm telling you, frankly, all of my children want to come to America, and Amrit has gotten tired of asking them, why? And they have no answer. They just want to come. And America, they don't say Uganda. It's really part of our psyche very strongly that development is a linear path. And somebody is ahead and somebody is behind. That needs to be challenged by all of us. There are many things you miss by walking on that path that you can learn from somewhere else. For example, the amount of resourcefulness you see in India that people adapt to things. They don't have specialized tools for every little thing. And yet everything gets done. They're just adapting different things. It's so creative, so innovative. I mean, I wish I had some of those slides I could show you and you'd, you'd you know, wonder where it comes from. They're all uneducated people. Creating things like this man who's made a bicycle which you can use to cross a river. It just floats on it. All from things just put together, it, it, there's no cost to it. Now, if uh, a nice bicycle company finds out about this, it's obviously going to go patent it and sell it all over the world. This guy is not patent, he's telling everybody like that. Whoever wants to make it, make it, you know? There's so much to be learned also. That's what I'm saying. So if we are ready for that collaboration in that spirit, that we are also going to learn, and they, uh, who, they will also learn, we'll all learn together, and we'll work with some basic principles of where we want to take the world. For me, sustainability is a very important issue. Whatever you do, if there is no sustainability and social justice involved in it, like the 5% population, 30% resources kind of an example, this won't work. So keeping that in mind, if we can develop solutions together, of course, there's a lot to be learned, and I'm, I'm totally for it. Where will it go? Can it be scalable? I, I think we should not worry about scale before we even start something. This really reminds me of a story, uh, who was it, Benjamin Franklin, who discovered electricity? And then uh, Faraday. Faraday made the first demonstration of electric current in front of the Royal Society in UK, whatever, of scientists or something. And he showed how, you can't see electricity, right? And there were no instruments to show what electricity can do. And we are talking of time, there was no electricity. Uh, he made this magnet move inside another magnet, and there was a current that got created which could be detected by deflection at the other end. So he says, see, this phenomenon I've discovered, he showed everyone. So one person in the audience said, uh, that's very nice, Mr. Faraday, but of what use is it? And uh, Faraday replies, uh, sir, of what use is a newborn baby? So let's go with that spirit. If you're trying to start something new, we are always ready to learn from other examples, but I, I think thinking of scaling up something faster is also coming from a certain ambition, uh, which is to show, instead of to really do the hard donkey work, uh, just start going there. Uh, that is what I would say. That caveat, and then I'd say yes. Well, thank you very much for that great presentation. That's all we have for you today. And I want to thank you very much for uh, this opportunity and for this interaction. And, uh, and I know if, uh, if anyone else has questions for Mr. Gulati, he'd be happy to after, uh, answer afterwards. So. Yeah, I'm around for a while, so. <laughs> all right, thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.